Jennifer Stefano is with us. Jennifer is a Republican strategist of the Commonwealth Foundation, a fellow with the Independent Women's Forum, IWF.org, CommonwealthFoundation.org. Jennifer Stefano is her Twitter handle, and uh, or at IWF. And uh, Jennifer, the vast majority of people who are making a pile of money in America have paid leave. Uh, this is uh, according to uh, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 95% of people in the top 10% of income earners in the United States have some form of paid sick leave. Among the lowest tenth, only 33% uh, have that access. And the highest wage group, 43% have paid family leave compared with just 6% in the bottom group. The, the, the thesis that I'm putting forward here is that we're confusing welfare with basic foundational stuff that a society should have in order for people to have a reasonable standard of living. And it seems to me that paid family leave, uh, it went from 12 weeks in the Build Back Better bill, you know, and then over the objections of Joe Manchin down to zero, and then now it's coming back up to four weeks, and we'll see where this goes. But I would argue that that is just the core stuff that a society should, that, that the citizens of a society should expect to have available to them. It is available in every other developed country in the world, after all. What say you? Yeah, and I think you're seeing a big increase in paid leave in the private sector. And I also share your concern about how we're helping low-income people, and both men and women. I am really tired of this being offered only to women. Um, it should be offered to everyone across the board. And my concern is that a big government federal program, which according to the Congressional Budget Office will, only, will already be bankrupt when you start it, is not the answer. Tom, my concern is that a one-size-fits-all solution doesn't work. And there is research that shows that it is very costly to women and actually suppresses our wages and our employment opportunities. And we've seen that not just in states in America that have done it, but in other countries. How can it be costly to women to get four weeks off when they give birth? Yeah, that's a great question because we become a liability in the marketplace. When you only offer it to women, we become more costly than men. Oh, we I see what you're saying. Well, I, you know, what if we just offered it to everybody? I mean, I, I agree with you. This, this is, right. you know, these kind of things should not be just for women. I, you know, totally agree with you. Okay, I'm glad you're saying that because I, I really am tired of men need to step up and they need to be fathers. Also, what about gay men? Does one of them have to choose to be maternal? I just want to proudly say at my institution, the Commonwealth Foundation, we have 12 weeks family leave for both genders and we have unlimited PTO because uh, we believe people need to take care of their family, whatever that may look like. And you don't have to have a child even, but you, you may have someone sick that you need to take care of. So we did it in, in the private sector and we did it because because we do believe it matters. We are one of the 70% of the Americans that believe paid family leave is important. We give 12 full weeks. And what you've seen over um, more, than, more than a decade is that the private sector continues to stop up. Now you're asking why is it accelerated? If we could do it as a federal mandate, wouldn't that be better? My answer is no. I, I actually think that'll be highly costly because there's a cultural issue here, Tom. And that is this. It's that largely men tend not to take this time off, thus still making women feel like more of a liability when we do take it. And higher wage earners tend to be offered it because they tend not to take it. And what happens is if you do a big federal mandate like this, there's been some studies in states that have done it that show that it actually benefits middle and upper middle class women and doesn't help um, lower income women as intended. So well, while I can the premise, a one-size-fits-all federal mandate isn't the answer. I think we can look at other solutions. Then I would argue that it simply wasn't done right if that was the outcome. But the simple fact of the matter is that what you and your organization and Commonwealth Foundation have done, which is commendable, is only available to 6% of the low-wage workers in the United States. And, and you know, we're not... You're not going to see American business suddenly get enlightened, particularly when it comes to people who are making minimum wage or, you know, e even in the bottom, I'd say, half of, America, of the American workforce. So if you believe, Jennifer, if you truly believe that this is something that should be available to everybody, not just, you know, wealthy white people who work at Commonwealth Foundation, or I, let me take the race out of it, wealthy people or, you know, upper middle class people who work at Commonwealth Foundation, then then shouldn't this shouldn't government either 
Well, I'm not even going to ask it as a question. I'm just going to make the assertion. It, it seems to me that your concern is, oh, my God, if we make this a government program and government pays those 12 weeks, because there's a lot of small employers who probably can't deal with the expense of that, then some billionaire is going to have to pay more in taxes, and, oh, my God, we can't have that. Isn't that, that is the essence of your argument, is it not? No, I think if you guys ever want to win anything, you have to stop pretending like all you need to do is tax the rich. Like, fine, tax the rich. Like, great. You won't have and the rich money. are paying like less than 1% in income taxes. Let's start That's with just reasonable taxes for rich people. Let me finish. You guys do not fund all these programs you want by just taxing the rich. You are going to have to convince the American people who are not stupid because they know this, that it is going to cost all of us. It is not just going to stay with the rich. It never does. Then how do they do it in every other developed country in the world, Jennifer? What's what's so unique about America that only in America we can't tax the rich? They have walked back these programs because of the unintended consequences, particularly for women. So I just want to be in Denmark. I would strongly encourage you and your followers to go look at what happened in Denmark to women and how it suppressed career growth and wage growth. You can look to California as well, who did this. And you saw a huge increase in the length of unemployment, especially for younger women. So do it across so both are, genders, as you suggested. I mean, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. So, but let me say this. There is a cost. So right now, the, the suggestion yes. is that it would be 0.4% to the payroll tax. Well, Tom, that will put the program immediately into a $7 billion deficit. The Congressional Budget Office, which is not a partisan office, says by 2028, in order to in any way fund this program, you're going to need to increase payroll taxes by 240 percent. Now, the rich can sustain it. The middle class, maybe. But who are you crushing? You're crushing the working poor. And by the way, in states like Pennsylvania, we're doing a big poverty project. 56 percent of low income. Then let's just pay for it out of the general fund. Six billion dollars is nothing out of the general fund. I mean, we, you, you know, we've got eight hundred billion dollars a year for defense. We can't spend six billion dollars to help out people who are who who just had a death in the family or who who just gave birth of both you genders. Are still only this inevitably will go and benefit these upper middle class women that you do not want to fund. Because I am telling you what has happened in states that have done this, you're only going to be funding 66% of the wages for low-income workers, and oftentimes in a one-income household, particularly if it's headed by a female, they cannot afford to take the that The proposal in Build Back Better pays 90% of wages for the bottom 10% of workers in America, not 66%. That, no, the program would fund 66% of the wages for paid family leave. Now, um, that can change. Uh, you know, workers making $15,000 or less a year would receive the highest wage replacement rate, 90%. But they would have, they the will have had to have had earned $2,000 in the two years prior, as well as some level of income immediately preceding the leave. You know, which is just, it's just designed to prevent people who are, you know, just, just hopped into the job market the week before they got, you know, pregnant or something like that from, from claiming this or gave birth. Okay, and I don't know, like, why are we penalizing them if it's a if it's a benefit offered by their government? Why would why shouldn't they jump in and get that right? You guys don't believe in work requirements around welfare. I mean, let's just be really honest that there are there is waste, fraud, and abuse, and it's much harder to route out in big federal programs, which is why they become so costly. And then women or men or men who legitimately need the help cannot get it. If you look at a study of these programs, and there's really great research out there from most, you can look at the Cato Institute, you can look at the Brookings, that shows inevitably these programs like so Right-wing think tanks are always gonna show this. Look at the Economic Policy Institute. A left-wing think tank has found the largely the exact opposite. I mean, either this is the right thing to do, and we as a society should figure out how to make sure it's available to people, not just to the wealthy people, the the 95 percent who have, you know, in the in the top in the top 10 percent of income earners, but also to the bottom 10 percent who only have six percent access to these kind of things. We either do it or we don't. Yeah, I concur. The question is, how do we do it? Where you and I are having a debate is not on the virtue virtuous nature of whether or not we. Oh, it's to whether it's the role of government. Absolutely, and I'm saying and it is. Businesses are hard. As the owner of a small business, I'm saying it is. They're all super progressive and woke. So my first question is, all these woke people, Delta, Coca-Cola, why aren't y'all yelling at that? They are hardly conservative. Okay? So they're not doing it in yeah, the free market. Woke, woke slurs aside, it, it, this, the, again, it's this, we're, 
we're debating whether this should be something that we as a country agree should happen. And, and, and either, either we could pass a law saying every employer must offer this, which I, I'm pretty sure that's how it works in Germany. I lived in Germany for a year and I knew a person who was on uh, you know, paid leave at the time and they were getting it from the organization that I worked for. Um, but I'm sure that there's all kinds of nuance to that. But either we do it as a country, either we mandate employers or we, or we pick up the tab. I mean, what other choices are there other than saying to low-income workers, tough luck, you're on your own, which is what you're suggesting. My first thing is I, I, don't, I think it's a false narrative to say we either federally mandate it or we, we do nothing. My, my first or we federally is, pay for it. We can make a societal compact that we want to strengthen families. Although I will say the progressives have been doing a lot of work saying that families are, in fact, structures of white supremacy, Tom. So the mere Oh, come on, Jennifer. Je Tom. Google the, the National Family Council. I, I will send it to you. Yeah. They are doing a webinar on how the traditional family is a, a structure of white supremacy. That is okay, That's a whole other discussion for a whole other time. I'm sorry, Jennifer.